All right, guys, welcome to the part two of the 2024 Lime Business Study Guide. So we're going to talk about the CSLB history and background. So the state of the contractor state license for the CSLB was established in 1929 uh, as the Contractors License Bureau under the Department of Professional and Vocational Standards. Today, the CSLB is part of the Department of Consumer Affairs. And remember when it was created, that would be 1929. Okay, that will be on the test. There is a 15 member board appoint, uh, board, I guess. Um, this was a, it pretty much appoints the CSLB ex executive officer and registered contractors, a register of contractor and direct administrative policy for the board's operations. The CSLB board um, includes nine public members, eight are non-contractors and one is a local building official. Okay, five contractors and one labor representative. The governor makes nine, uh, 11 appoint, uh, appoint, um, appointments and four are made by the legislator, legislature. So the governor is going to make uh, 11 of those 15 members, uh, I guess, become the representatives. And the, the other four are going to be done by the legislator. Okay, so remember that on the test, that will be on the test. They might ask you how many board uh, members are there. If there's 15. If they ask you um, what, wh wh how is it split up by, just remember that nine are public members, eight are contractors, and one is a local building official, and five of them are contractors, and one is a, local, is a labor representative. Just remember that. The board holds regular scheduled uh, public meetings at various locations in the state. These meetings provide the public with an opportunity uh, for input on agenda items and other issues. The CSLB licenses and regulates contractors in 45 license classifications that, that constitute the construction industry. Currently, there are around 285,000 contractors uh, license, licenses in the state. The register oversees approximately 400 employees who currently who work at the headquarters office in Sacramento and field offices across the state. Headquarters staffs receive and process applications for new contractor's license, additional classifications, and changes of license records and license renewals. Staff also reviews and maintains records of disciplinary actions and initiated by the field offices, provided um, provide verified certi certificates of licensure used in court, and other legal actions and provide other support services. Headquarters, um, <coughs> excuse me. Headquarters directs the activities of field office and initiates all disciplinary actions resulting in investigations. Field office staffs investigate consumer um, complaints against contractors. The statewide investigative fraud team, uh, known as SWIFT, addresses unlicensed activity. Again, that will be on the test as well. So pretty much the CSLB website, um, you can use that to uh, look up a contractor's uh, license. You could go to checkthelicensefirst.com. Pre pretty much it provides the ability to look up a contractor's license number, their name or business name, and obtain license contact information, um, the license status, and CSLB legal actions, if any, the classifications held, the business type, and bond and workers' compensation insurance information. Home improvement salesperson, um, Reg registration also are listed on the website's uh, license lookup page. Identical information uh, is available through the CSLB automated public information line. That would be their phone number, which operates 24 hours per day. Also available is recorded information on licensing and, exa and examination pro procedures, complaint procedures, and how to obtain information on a complaint that has been referred for legal action. The location and hours of the CSLB offices and current topics such as recently passed laws or regulations. Callers can also order forms, applications, and other publications. So the Find My License Contractor feature on the CSLB website allows users to search for licensed contractors in specific classifications by geographic area, ba um, area based on zip code or city. The randomly displayed, li uh, resu displayed results links to licensed records and can be downloaded as either a PDF or a Word file. The CSLB aims to protect those whose homes and property are directly affected by disasters, such as wildlife, um, wild, wildfires, floods, mudflows, uh, earthquakes, and pipeline explosions. The CSLB offers material 
on local assistance and disaster recovery centers, as well as monitor. Uh, excuse me, as well as monitor. Uh, where is it at? Where is it at? As monitors a disaster hotline. Sorry about that. To aid those in need. The CSLB offers a variety of publications and guides to help consumers make informed choices when contact and uh, contacting for home improvement. Speakers can be provided for groups um, and interested in learning more about the CSLB. So pretty much all this talks about is when it was established. That'd be 1929. Okay, it's part of the Department of Consumer Affairs. There's 15 board of appointment of appointed members. Remember that 11 of those are are appointed by the governor. Four are pretty much made by the legislator. There is nine public members. Eight of those are, are non-contractors. One is a public building official and five are contractors and one is a labor representative. Remember that that will be on the test. Okay. The, the SWIFT team pretty much investigates non-licensed contractors doing work in the state of California. Okay. So if you get a question about the SWIFT uh, team and it says, what is their operations within the CSLB or what do they do? Just remember they go after non-licensed contractors. Okay. Okay, so the CSLB mission, the Contractor State License Board protects consumers by regulating the construction industry through policies that promote health and safety and general welfare of the public in matters regula uh, regulating construction, including home improvement. The Contractor State License Board accomplishes this by ensuring that construction, including home improvement, is performed in a safe, competent, and professional manner. Licensing contractors and enforcing licensing laws requires uh, Licensure for any person practicing or offering to practice construction contracting, enforcing the law, regu regulations, and standards governing construction contracting in a fair and uniform manner, providing re resolutions for disputes that arise from construction activities, and educating consumers so that they can make informed choices. So if you want to know more about the CSLB, here's the headquarters. They won't ask they won't ask you where, where they're located, right? I'm just putting this up there so that you can um, see. Pretty much, you might get a question on your on your state license exam, and it might ask you, hey, um, if you want to find out uh, someone's contractor's license, what do you do, right? And it might ask you to, it might ask you to, uh, uh, it, might, it might ask you, like, uh, where can you find that information? And Obviously, you go to the CSLB website, check my check the license first dot com, or you could call them at their at the official um, CSLB number, and those can, would all be correct, right? So the, uh, they'll probably say like all of them, or they might only have one, right? That'll also be a question. I guarantee that. So here you got the locations of all the um, offices of the CSLB. This you don't have to know about it. Okay, they're not going to test you on this. I'm just putting it up here so that you can see the locations, okay? Um, before um, before the test used to be in a lot of these locations or in a um, an official testing site from the CSLB, right? Now, remember that in my previous video, we talked about how they no longer do the testing themselves. They've transferred it over to a private company that does it for them. So, you know, that won't even be pretty much a, a big matter all right a lot of these guys though still have their own offices in the st in the same locations where they would take the test they just have departments for like investigative centers um or maybe like um dispute centers that sort of thing so enforcement procedures and complaints and citations so section one enforcement procedures and complaints and citations Complaints against contractors may be filed with the CSLB by homeowners, other contractors, subcontractors, material suppliers, or employees. Any entity may also file complaints. So, pretty much, you can contact the CSLB to give them a complaint, okay? And pretty much, these complaints can result in disciplinary actions if, they've, if the CSLB finds that they are not doing proper work, okay? Or they violated some sort of pay, uh, payment uh, program. Uh, a process, uh, maybe they skimped out on materials, that sort of thing, okay? So you as the contractor, though, you can also do this as well if a, if a general doesn't pay you or they don't provide the materials that they uh, said they were going to provide. Pretty much that 
would be your first option to getting uh, problems settled, the CSLB. And then from there, you go to different, um, with different processes. Common complaints made against contractors involve poor craftsmanship, abandonment of a project, failure to pay subcontractors, suppliers, or employees, building code violations, lack of reasonable diligence in executing a construction project, use of false, misleading, or deceptive advertising, asking for excessive down payments or not including payment schedules in a home improvement contracts, failure to obtain workers' compensation insurance, and violation of the law governing home improvement contracts. So if you don't follow the rules, you can have disciplinary actions against you and your license. Complaints against licensed contractors. When a complaint is made against a licensed contractor, the CSLB reviews it to determine if it falls within the CSLB jurisdiction. The CSLB sends a confirmation to the person who filed the complaint and sends a notice to the licensed contractor to determine if the complaint can be resolved without further board involvement. If the complaint has not been resolved after the contractor has been notified, the CSLB representative may contact the complaint, the complainant and, and the respondent, the licensee, to request additional information and, if necessary, documentation. If appropriate, the CSLB will attempt mediation. If mediation is, unsu is unsuccessful, the CSLB may recommend settlement through its arbitration program. Recommend, it, um, <clears throat> recommend that, complaint, that complainant contact the surety company that issues the contractor's bond, file a claim in small claims court, or file a civil suit in, in superior court. So pretty much, if... <coughs> if Pretty much the client and the contractor don't don't come to an agreement after the, the complaint has been made. Pretty much the the client can go after your contractor's bond, which right now is twenty five thousand dollars. So it, it could take your money because you will have to pay that back. Um, you could go to court in small claims court or in, or have a civil suit. Right. That'd be something a little bit more more. Um, uh how do i explain it? It, it it's a bit not dangerous but uh it's a bit more um serious right because that will now be a civil suit in a superior court um if the cslb finds that it's warranted it may contact and investigate it may conduct an investigation to determine if there are violations of contractors um of the contract state license 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 law an investigation may involve interview, interviewing the complainant, the contractor, and other parties who can furnish relevant information. What happens if a violation is established? All right, and pay attention to this, guys, right here, because this will be on the test. Okay? If a violation is established but is, but is an isolated or minor one, the CSLB may send the licensee an advisory notice. An advisory notice informs the, CSL, the licensee that the CSLB is aware of the violation and that a future occurrence of the same violation may result in a more stringent board action okay so they'll give you a warning if it's maybe your first one or it's a really minor one right for for some violations the cslb may issue a letter of a, a don admonishment this may require the licensee to submit a corrective action plan showing co compliance with the law and is publicly dis um, disclosable on the licensee record for one or two years. So that can also be a little bit more um, for different violations, right? A little bit more serious violations. If a more serious violation is established, the Register of Contractors may issue a citation, which can include in order to correct the project, make restitutions to an injured party, that'd be pay back uh, someone that's injured or pay them for the hospital bills and maybe uh, days, or in, day, day, days they can't work. Pay a civil penalty of up to eight thousand for most violations, and up to thirty thousand dollars for serious violations. If the licensee complies uh, with the citation orders, the CSLB takes no further action. If this licensee con contests all or any part of the citation, an informal citation conference may be held to resolve the citation. If the matter is not settled, a hearing can be set before an administrative law judge of the state of California. At the hearing, the licensee can argue against the citation orders. If the licensee prevails at this hearing, the CSLB takes no further action. If, however, the licensee does not prevail and does not comply with final citation orders, the CSL, the licensee, uh, the license may be suspended, then revoked. For f uh, f flagrant um, violations of law, the register will take administrative action by filing an, an accusation with the state attorney general stating that the board's intent to suspend or revoke the license. 
The licensee may, may be provided the opportunity to resolve the matter at an, an informal settlement conference. If the matter is not settled, the licensee is given the opportunity to defend themselves at a hearing before an administrative law judge. So, the following procedures may be used to decide a case. The licensee may choose to be uh, to have a hearing before an administrative judge. The recommendation of the judge is used by the register in determining the appropriate action to take. The licensee and the register may negotiate a settlement of the case. The settlement is known as a stipulation. If the licensee fails to respond to the accusation, the case will be considered in default. The register will decide on the appropriate action to take against the licensee. The decision of the register may include, or the register uh, may include various uh, remedies. That be the, revoca the revocation of the license. The licensee right to contract is taken away. The license shall not be reinstated or reissued for one to five years after the effective date of the decision. None of the official personnel listed in the CLB records for revoked um, uh, for revoked license and who have been found to have known about or participated in the acts or omissions constituting grounds for revocation may apply uh, for a license until the penalty period is over. The licensee may also show may also must show that they have comp complied with provisions of the decision and settled any loss caused by the act or omission that resulted in the revocation of the license and must file a disciplinary bond in the amount set by the register. Suspension of the license. The licensee is not entitled to operate during the period of suspension. A disciplinary bond must be filed before the license is reinstated or reissued. State of suspension or revocation, that would be your probation. The licensee must abide by certain terms and conditions to keep the suspension or revocation from going into effect. They also must file a disciplinary bond to remain in business during this period. Suspension or revocation of the license will result in any of the terms of the agreement are violated. Recovery of investigation and enforcement and enforcement costs. The licensee to maintain a good, clear standing or as a condition for renewal and reinstatement of the license must pay the cost as ordered or, or as stipulated. Dismissal with no penalties. That would be your matters that have been dismissed and are not disclosed to the public. Injunction against unlawful activity. Upon establishing what a blatant violation of the law has occurred, the CSLB may go to court to request an injunction to immediately stop the unlawful activity. Criminal charges. If a blatant violation of the law has occurred, the CSLB may refer to the complaint to the local office of the district attorney for possible criminal charges. So a what's a complaint disclosure? One, one CSLB, once the CSLB has determined that a probable violation of law has occurred, which, if proven, will present a risk, to, a, a risk of harm to the public and for which suspension or revocation of the contractor's license would be appropriate. The date, the nature, and the status of the complaint will be disclosed to the public. A disclaimer stating that the, the compliant is, at, at this time, only an allegation will accompany this disclosure. Citations will, will be disclosed to the public from the date of issuance and for, and for five years from the date of compliance. Accusations that result in suspension or state revocation of the contractor's license shall be disclosed from the date of the, from the, date the accusation is filed. And for, and for seven years after the accu uh, accusation has been settled, including the terms and conditions of probation, all revocations that are, that are stayed, um, stayed shall be disclosed indefinitely from the, from the effective date of the revocation. Addressing complaints against unlicensed contractors. In California, it is a misdemeanor to engage in the business or act in the capacity of a contractor without a contractor's license unless the contractor meets the criteria for exemption to file in the Business and Professions Code, Section 7040 through 7054.5. When a complaint is filed against an unlicensed contractor, the CSLB may verify that the accused individual or firm contracted without a license and will, with sufficient evidence, determine the amount of financial injury involved. How does the CSLB process complaints against unlicensed contractors? 
when the board receives a complaint against unlicensed contractors, it may issue an administrative citation or file a criminal action with the local district's attorney's office. In some cases, it may initiate conjun uh, injun injunctions proceedings against the non-licensee through the office of, of the attorney general or the district attorney. Okay, so remember, that's the difference between unlicensed and the license, okay? The previous slides were for licensed. This is for unlicensed contractors. How does the CSLB process complaints against unlicensed contractors? When the board re receives a complaint against an unlicensed contractor, it may issue an administrative citation or file a criminal action with the local district attorney's office. In some cases, it, in, it may initiate injunction proceedings against the non-licensee through the office of the attorney general or district's attorney. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> A citation for unlicensed contractors. The, re the registrar may issue a citation to an unlicensed contractor when there is a probable cause to believe that the, co that the person is acting in the capacity of a contractor or engaging in the business of contracting without a license in good standing current and uh, not under suspension with the CSLB. The citation includes an order of, ab of abatement to cease and desist and, desist and a civil penalty of, it of up to $15,000. Unless the, unless the board receives a written appeal within 15 days after the citation is served, the citation becomes a final order of the register. And by the way, keep that in, keep that info, okay? Remember, it's the, the civil penalty can be up to $15,000, and you only got 15 days to dispute that, okay? The civil penalty is paid uh, to the CSLB. If the citation is appealed, an informal settlement conference may be held to, re help to resolve the citation. I mean the result of the yeah the result of the citation. If the matter is not settled, an administrative law judge will hear the appeal. The administrative law judge submits a decision to uphold, modify, and dismiss the citation. The decision is that is then sent to the register for adoption. It, if the citation if the cited unlicensed contractor continues to contract without a license, the register may refer to the case to the local district attorney for criminal charges. All right. If criminal charges are done, the CSLB may refer to investigations to the local prosecutor to file criminal charges if criminal charges are filed. The unlicensed contractor appeals in local court, which renders a final decision on the case. The court may order a fine, a fine, a probation, a restitution, a jail sentence, or all, or all of these injunctions. The registrar may file may apply for an injunction with the superior court of either the county in which an alleged practice um, practice or transaction took place or the county in which the unlicensed person maintains a business or residence. An injunction restrains any unlicensed person from acting in the capacity or engaging in the business of contracting without a license in good standing with the CSLB. How does the CSLB process complaints against un unregistered Salespersons. So a salesperson is it's pretty much those people who go door to door. Um, it could be for residential. It could be uh, maybe they go to local businesses like a commercial building. Maybe they go to a hospital <coughs> and they're selling services for a contractor. Okay. That's what a salesperson is. They must also be registered. Okay. In my previous slide. In my previous uh, um, PowerPoint, we talked about salespersons and who they have to be registered with. Okay, the same citation, pretty much a uh, process used for complaints against unlicensed contractors, is used for complaints against un like unregistered home improvement salespersons. Disciplinary action <laughs> also can be taken against the licensed uh, contractor who employs the unregistered salesperson. Okay, and now we're going to talk about SWIFT the state investigative fraud team okay in addition to the complaint process the cslb established swift and an arm of the enforcement division that focuses on the underground economy and unlicensed contractors who prosper at the expense of consumers and legitimate businesses swift has the authority to visit any job site without cause or complaint ask contractors to provoke to produce proof of licensure in good standing inside those who are not properly licensed so pretty much again that's what that's what we talked about about what swift does they go 
and find job sites <clears throat> and they pretty much just check if they're licensed or not okay and if they are nothing happens if they're not that, then you know i've seen people get arrested or i've heard about it um you can be taken to court you can get fined that sort of thing that's what they do okay and when they say that the expense of the consumers and legitimate businesses i mean yes and no right if you're not licensed and you're, you're doing all this I mean, you're probably doing it cheaper than a licensed contractor would. And honestly, you don't probably, you probably don't charge well. I mean, and you probably pay the guys that work under you cheap because that's what unlicensed contractors do. And even licensed contractors, the majority of contractors, and I can't speak for other states, which I'm pretty sure it's the same thing, but in California, non-union contractors, like, I mean, the pay is low, low. So, you know, obviously, depending on the trade, some make more than others, right? If you're like a licensed electrician, a licensed plumber, um, a welder, right? Well, yeah, you might make more working for a non-union contractor than maybe, than maybe working for a union. But honestly, um, I mean, those are rare, really rare. The majority of non-licensed contractors and contractors, they don't pay that much. So when they see when you talk about the expense of consumers and legitimate business, I don't think so. It's more so just to pay your taxes. That's pretty much it. That's what the state wants, which is not a bad thing. I mean, you're supposed to, you know, do your part too, because honestly, you know, that, that's how this country runs. Now, when that, when those taxes are used for other things though, that you're, you're not, you know, happy about, that's a different story, but that, that's more into politics. <coughs> All right, home improvement and contracts. So home improvement, right? What is home improvement? Home improvement is the repairing, remodeling, altering, converting, modernizing of, or adding to residential properties in, and includes, but is not limited to con the construction, the erection, the replacement or improvement of driveways, swimming pools, including spas, hot tubs, terraces, patios, awnings, storm windows, solar energy systems, landscaping, fences, porches, garages, fallout shelters, basements, and other home improvements of structures or land adjacent to a dwelling. Home improvement is also the installation of home improvement goods or the furnishing of home improvement services. And uh, guys, I know a lot of this is like vocab, but believe it or not, you, um, a lot of this will be on the test, right? Because they might ask you, what, what's home improvement? And this might be part of the of the answer, right? Altering, converting, and modernizing. <clears throat> the rest might say, you know, building a foundation or something. Well, it fits into that. But if they ask you for the definition of home improvement, this would be your answer. <clears throat> home improvement. What's the home improvement contractor? A home improvement contractor include including a swimming pool contractor is a contractor licensed by the state by the California State License Board who is engaged in the business of home improvement, either full-time or part-time. That will also be important, so take, you know, remember it. Home improvement contracts and service and repair contracts. The home improvement business in California constitutes a large portion of the state's um, con construction industry. Problems can occur because of the misunderstanding of basic requirements and the agreement between the owner and contractor. Legal, uh, special legal requirements were enacted specifically for home improvement contractors to el eliminate as many of these problems as possible. In 2004, through SB 30, and in 2005, through AB 316, the legislator, the, the legislator made significant additions to the information contractors must provide to the buyer of home improvements. The idea behind the legislation, the legislation is to use the contract itself to inform homeowners of the most important contract requirements to help them better understand the process. The ability of this system, of this simple consumer protection uh, information, is intended to reduce the number of disputes between contractors and home uh, homeowners, and therefore the number of complaints that homeowners make to the CSLB. The following rules are required to, for improvement contracts and any changes made to the contracts must be in writing, legally <coughs> legible, sorry about that, <coughs> and be easy to understand and inform 
a consumer of their legal right to cancel or rescind the contract. A home improvement contractor must contain various information, notices, and disclosures for the protection of the consumer. In addition, a service and repair contract must be, must be used by the licensed contractors for jobs $750 or, um, or less. Provided that the contract meets all four of the new requirements, there are various disclosure requirements applicable to the service and repair contract. In addition, a service and repair contract that does not meet specified requirements is subject to the requirements applicable to a home improvement contract, regardless of the aggregate contract price. Any violation of the provisions of law applic applicable to home improvement and service and repair contracts subject the contractor to discipline. The legislature occasionally re revisits home improvement contract and service and repair contract requirements to address consumer protection concerns. Um, AB 2471, effective January 1st, 2001, extend the right, extends the right to cancel home improvement contracts, service, and, and repair contracts, property assess clean energy assessment contracts, and seminar sales contracts from three business days to five business days for those 75 and older. All right, so pretty much the, the previous, previously before 2021, Everybody had three days to cancel their contract. Now, if you're older than 65, you have 10 days. Or Sorry about that, not 10. Five days, five business days. Okay, so Mondays through Friday. Saturdays and Sundays do not count. Okay, it has to be Monday to Friday, right? You got five days, five business days to c cancel your contract if you're 75 years older. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be on the test. Because anytime they add new stuff, that will be on the test. All right. So, SB 1189, effective January 1st, 2021, includes the definition of the home improvement, um, home improvement, the reconstruction, restoration, or rebuilding of residential property damaged or destroyed by a disaster for which a state of emergency has been declared by either the governor or the president. So, pretty much, um, if you put a contract, you must include what a state of emergency is, right? And obviously that'll be in your contract and that's that's to protect the con the client to know what is considered a state of emergency, all right? And the reason that's important is because depending on, typically it's three days, it's 10 days if it's a, if it's a state of emergency to cancel your contract. And also if you're on license and, you do, and you, you're doing something where there's a state of emergency, I mean, that instead of it being a misdemeanor, it can now be a felony if if you if you contract without a license, and if they catch you, of course. The SB seventy five seven effective January first, twenty twenty two, um, cl clarifies that a contract that a contract for a residential solar energy system is considered home improvement when installed on a residential building or property or the purpose of the home improvement contract uh, contract requirements. <coughs> It also requires a home improvement salesperson to identify the owner or tenant to whom a sale is being made, um, is being made the business name and license number of the contractor who they are representing and makes it a misdemeanor for a home improvement salesperson to assist, recommend, or select, or otherwise guide a owner or tenant in the selection of a contractor for ser services unless the CSLB receives notification of the salesperson's employment by the home improvement contractor. For more information about home improvement, um, the salesperson's is pretty much on the next slide. Um, okay, so all that saying is a salesperson cannot recommend or guide the homeowner to to choosing a contractor, right? You can't, you can't force them. Like, for example, if you work for contractor A, you can't force the contract, uh, the client to choose a only because you know you work for them and you could do that but you gotta you gotta you gotta contact the CSLB but imagine you're working for a contractor A and you also work for contractor B but the CSLB only knows that you work for contractor A well you can't say hey, go for B go for B right you can't recommend them anything you just got to show um, your product and obviously, by you showing your product, you're going to talk who your employer is. But you can't say that guy, that guy, or that that contractor, that contractor. You can't do any of that. So, 
in, in drawing up contracts, uh, contractors should pay strict attention to the requirements uh, for print typeface and point ties um, of, the of the notices and disclosures. For example, unless a larger print face is specified, text in any printed form shall be at least 10 point type and the, and the heading shall not be less than um, 10 point type bold, bold face type. So pretty much when you make a contract, it can't be less than 10 point type. That, that's the size of your of your lettering and on every heading right so your header that's that that could be your the company the header should say you, you could have a picture of your company or maybe your name of your company that should be in 10 bold face and where it says home improvement it should be 10 point bold face okay or more it could be more but the minimum is at least 10. all right the cslb offers a um like uh like a free little guide it, it doesn't even look professional because honestly it just doesn't look that good but you know it, it's a good it's a good way of getting an idea of how it looks you can also buy one yourself from a from a publicing uh or publishing like company that does that or you can make one yourself too using their guide which that's what i did um eventually i started adding more stuff to it but you know it's a it's a good way of getting a contract <coughs> home warranties home warranties <clears throat> home warranties generally are not transferable except as provided for home roof warranties um so pretty much you can't transfer a warranty if you like if you did a plumbing a job to the next person that buys your home it'll just be only for roofs now i'm guessing you could maybe settle with settle something with the contractor and maybe they might transfer i don't think so though but you know that's more into like legal law um for home for for home roof warranties, the California Civil Code provides for any contract subject to this chapter that is entered in, on or after January one, nineteen ninety four, the warranty obligations shall shall inert the benefit of and shall directly enforce by any subsequent purchasers and transferees of the residential structure with without limitations unless the contract contains a clear and conspicuous provision limiting the transferability of the warranty. Home Improvement Salesperson Registration. <clears throat> Anyone who solicits, sells, negotiates, or executes home improvement contracts for a licensed contractor outside of the contractor's normal place of business, regardless of the dollar amount of, the, of these contracts, must be registered with the CSLB as a home improvement salesperson. The law allows home improvement salespersons to file, to file a single registration with the CSLB while still permitting them to represent multiple employers. So you can also do that as well if you have multiple employers. Now, obviously, you can't force the client to um, to to sign anything, right? You just got to show them and try to sell the point. All right, licensees are required to notify the CSLB in writing prior to employing an already registered um, um, home improvement salesperson, and to notify the CSLB in and in writing when employment of a registered um, home improvement salesperson ends. These notification forms are available on the CSLB website. Who is exempt from the home register home improvement salesperson <coughs> um, re registration requirement? Salespersons who only sell goods, um, goods or negotiate contracts at a fixed business establishment where the where the goods or services are exhibited or offered for sale are not considered home improvement salesperson. So, if you have a shop and you have, for example, let's say you you install windows. And you have a shop, and that shop has multiple um, displays, right, of different types of products that you sell. You don't have to have, you don't have to be registered with the CSLB as a salesperson because one, it's at your shop, and second, the client, the client would have to go inside themselves. You're not going up to their home and knocking on the door and, and you know offering your service. That's a whole different thing. The official personnel listed in the CSLB records for the contractor's license are also exempt from registration requirements. This includes individual contractors, qualifiers, partners, or offices, officers of corporations, and responsible managing officers, members, managers, or employees of an LLC. Other exemptions from the registration requirements include people who contract prospective buyers for the exclusive purpose of scheduling appointments for a registered home improvement salesperson and bona fide service or repair, peop or repair people who are employed by a licensed contractor and whose repair or service calls are limited to the service or repair initially re requested by the buyer.
What are qualifications for a home improvement salesperson? A home improvement salesperson must be at least 18 years old. There are no educational, resident, residency, or experience requirements. However, a home improvement salesperson must submit their fingerprints to the CSLB as part of the application process. And that's pretty much just to give you a background check because obviously they don't want people who have done crimes, right? Like serious crimes going to people's homes because that's just weird. You know what I'm saying? So they'll give if you want to get your home improvement salesperson's license or permit, I should say, um, then you would just have to get a, uh, your fingerprint scanned. So how do I apply for a registration? Pretty much you complete an online easy to fill application for registration of a home improvement salesperson at the website. You um, download it, you fill it out, you pay 200 bucks, all right, and you send that off to the CSLB headquarters office, okay? And also that will be on the test too, okay? So just remember, may I begin working as a HIS as soon as I have submitted my registration application and feed to the CSLB? To the CSLB? No, the CSLB must review your application and and issue a registration number before you may legally work as a home improvement salesperson. How long will it take to become registered? The CSLB processing times vary, vary depending on its workload, staff vacancies, etc. The CSLB website includes a processing time chart that lists the date of documents currently being processed, including HIS um, applications and renewals. The chart is updated weekly and helps keep applicants informed of current processing times. When does HIV registration, HIS registration uh, expire? The HIS registration expires two years from the last date of the month in which it was issued. The CSLB will mail a renewal application to your <coughs> to your address of uh, of record several weeks before your registration expires. Upon verification of the renewal, a new registration certificate will be mailed showing the new regist exp expiration date. What if my address has changed since my registration was issued? If your, if your address has changed since the registration was issued or last renewed, it is your responsibility to notify the CSLB in writing within 90 days of the change. If you have not received an advance notification of, re of renewal, notify the CSLB. This should be done no later than three weeks before your registration expires. What happens if a licensed contractor employs an unregistered salesperson? According to BP Code Section 7154, a contractor who employs an unregistered salesperson to negotiate home improvement contracts is subject to disciplinary action by the register. Furthermore, BP Code Section 7153 states that it is a misdemeanor for a person to act as a home improvement salesperson without being registered. In addition, it is possible, um, it is in addition to possible criminal action, the same section provides that an administrative citation may be issued to any unregistered person who engages in his occupation. Home improvement contract requirements. This section provides basic information about required elements in a home improvement contract, but is not limit it, but is not complete. So the basic requirements for a home improvement contract. The contract and any changes to the contract must be in writing and signed by all parties. The, the writing must be legibly and printed and printed forms must be uh, readable. Before any work is started, the contractor must give the buyer a copy of the contract signed and a, and dated by both contractor and the buyer. Unless a larger typeface is specified and law of reference above, text in any printed form shall be shall be at least ten point typeface, and the heading shall be in shall be in at least ten point boldface type. Except for a down payment, a contractor cannot demand or accept payment for work or materials until the work is actually done. Or materials are delivered. The down, the down payment may not exceed a thousand dollars or ten percent of the contract price, whichever is less. Okay, that's important right there. That will be on the test. So, for example, let's say, let's say you, you did a contract for a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, ten percent of a hundred thousand dollars is ten thousand dollars. You cannot ask for ten thousand dollars. Okay, so that's that would be illegal. Right, it's ten percent, and it's way it's way over a thousand dollars. You can only ask for a thousand dollars, even if it even if it would be a million dollars, you would only be able to ask for a thousand dollars down payment. Yeah, in the state of California. Now, let's say let's say it's let's say you did a contract for five hundred dollars, right? Ten percent is fifty bucks. 
So you could only ask for 50 bucks. You get what I'm saying? So that's that that's the thousand dollar or ten percent rule. Just remember that because that will be on the test. If the contract includes a salesperson commission, then the contract price, the payment to the salesperson shall be made on a pro rate um, route of bait, rate basis in proportion to the schedule of payment made by the contractor. The contract must must contain the name, the registration number of the salesperson, if they're included. The name and business address and license number of the contractor must be included. Obviously, that's a contract. The contract must include the full description and information about the following. The description of the work, the description of materials and equipment, the contract price, payment schedule, start and completion of work. That would be your date and description. Um, permits and tests that are needed for that, uh, that, that project. Permissible delays. That would be how, you know, maybe, maybe the weather doesn't permit because it's raining. Well, you can also put a delay in the contract and say, hey, if it rains, you know, our days are going to change, you know. So you got to make sure everything is in that contract because, honestly, a client can and they will sue you or not pay you just based on a simple error in the contract. And that does happen. So pay attention to that. They must also include a description and information for extra work, what is considered extra work, uh, required release of mechanics lane statements. And the owner's applicable right to, to cancellation. So let's talk about required notices and disclosure statements. A home improvement and sales pool contracts in California are required to have full text of several notices and disclosures. Some must be in the main body of the contract. Others may be attached separately. The full text um, of the required notices and disclosure statements are not included here. So some of them would be extra work and change orders, commercial general liability insurance, Workers' compensation insurance, performance of extra or change order uh, work notice, a mechanic's lane warning, a contractor's bond information, applicable right to cancel, and notice of cancellation instructions. A common pro uh, common problems with the uh, home improvement contracts. So some of them would be missing the notices, um, or the disclosures necessary that should be included, excessive down payment requests or received. Um, equipment to be used or installed is not detailed, and the materials to be used not described specifically. Job start and competition information are not clearly stated, and the described information and in described including dates. The bid or price are not carefully or completely established. Change orders are change orders pretty much are not included. Um, license number and home improvement salesperson registration numbers are missing. Failure to identify required building permits or indicate who is paying for them. Um, pay, and pretty much a no payment schedule. And you should always have a payment schedule. That way you can protect yourself as a contractor and the client can feel protected as well. Because that's what I always do. I, Whenever I have a, con a contract, even if it's $5,000 or $3,000, I always split it up in payments. Even if I might not get all the money on the get-go, you know, sometimes clients do. And when that happens, I make sure that I give them a, a pretty much a notice saying that they paid. So an invoice, like it's paid in full. They don't owe me, they don't owe me any money when they do that. Because uh, sometimes I like those kinds of clients because, you know, they're not BSing around. But sometimes you get clients that don't want to pay you. So man, imagine you charge $10,000 for something, right? Well, you can split that up in four payments. <clears throat> to you know, two thousand five hundred bucks, you know, and let's say once you get to the midway and you see that they're not paying you, just don't show up. Don't finish the contract, and you know, make sure you let them know in writing. Until you get your payment, you're not sending your guys back. Now that's legally well. You're not abandoning. You're not abandoning your project. You're just saying, hey, I you need to make some money off this, and you got to pay your guys. Now, by then, if they were to send you to court. They might, they might actually get a good case, but at the end of the day, because they didn't pay you and you haven't broken your contract, you're illegally, you're, you're, you're secure, right? The judge would pretty much have to hate you, I guess, for them to go on the client side because they also didn't do their obligation of paying you because they signed a contract as well. They're pretty much joint control agreements. The California Business and Profession Code provides for, um, provides for the uh, uh, optional use of joint control agreements, approved approved by the Register of Contractors covering full performance and payment. 
The CSLB does not license joint con control companies, nor does the CSLB have legal jurisdiction or joint control companies' activities, nor does it maintain lists of approved con joint control companies, or nor monitor their activities. Contractors who furnish a joint control as part of the terms of a home improvement contract should be aware that the law prohibits them from, from having any financial or other interests in the joint control company. It is the contractor's responsibility to determine whether or not to use a joint control agreement and responsibility for the incorporating a joint control addend uh, addendum in an, into an agreement rests solely with the joint control company. Contractors considering use of a joint control agreement should first contact an attorney. All right, guys, that's pretty. That's pretty much it for this part. We'll get to the next one later on.